everyone. I want to welcome you to the second ever episode of our vlog for YouTube. Now, last week I was talking all about fitting and figuring out to decide what size you should wear and all that jazz. So this time I thought that it was going to be very, very useful, particularly seeing as we've got a knit along coming up to talk a small bit about swatching and how to figure out what to do if your swatch doesn't work or if you don't have something that's straightforward like garter or stock net stitch, how do you go about measuring that? Because for me as a designer, it's very easy to put down on the paper. You need to go match this gauge exactly and off you go. And it's particularly easy for me because as when I'm designing, I do my swatch, I measure what it's at and then I do my design based on the actual gauge. As a knitter, when you come along, you're coming at it from the other end because you're taking what I've done and then you've got to figure out how you get your work to match up with that. And sometimes it'll match perfectly. Other times you might have a part that works and a part that doesn't. So you might, for instance, have the same stitch gauge, but the row gauge is different. Or if there's a couple of different stitch patterns used, you might get the gauge for one and not for another. And it kind of will leave you a little bit in between figuring out what you should or shouldn't be doing with things. So I thought I'd talk, just talk around the idea of swatching and gauge and why you do it and how you can make some changes if it's not coming out the way you want. So first thing I want to talk about is the most basic one, which is stockinette stitch, where you're going to do knit on right side, purl on the wrong side. Um, and if you haven't really done swatching before or you don't know what swatching is around, about, you might look at it and you'll see, oh, it's telling me to do four inches, 10 centimeters, and you go and you work the exact amount of stitches that it says on the gauge. Um, I would strongly encourage you to never do that. That's not going to give you a very helpful answer. And the reason for that is gauge changes a little at the edge of work, the edges might turn, curl or, um, you just you want a little bit more than those four inches. So usually if it's just a plain stitch or something like that, I'll aim for maybe um, six inches. So if it says that I've got it's over um, over the four inches, it was 20 stitches, for instance. I'll divide four into 20 and then I'll know that that will mean that there should be for the gauge five stitches for every inch. So if I want to add two more inches on to make that six inches, I'll take the 20 and then add a five, add a five. So I'll cast on around 30 stitches. And that means if my gauge is a little tighter or a little looser, I've got a lot more stitches that I can measure it with. Because if you have very tight gauge and so that you have got much, much fewer um, uh, or much less inches and more stitches in the same space of time, but you've only cast on enough for those 20 stitches, you're not even going to get to the four inches. So by actually adding a couple of extra stitches, it means that you know that you've got a little bit of leeway. So if your gauge is off in the other direction, you can kind of swing around and change, or you've got enough to measure with so you know the actual gauge. Also, I would suggest doing a little bit of edging. So probably even over the six inches, just two, three stitches on each side in garter, moss stitch, anything at all that doesn't curl. When I start off with, I don't know if I've got any swatches around here, probably don't, but you, here, here we go. There's one that's still on the needles. And you can see at the very bottom here, I'll always start off with just garter stitch, just a few rows. It doesn't need to be much. And I would try to remember to, particularly for stockinette stitch, a couple of stitches on each end to help it lie flat. So that's the starting thing. And as you, you're knitting through it, you can actually do a small bit of checks as you're going. And if it looks like you're way off gauge, I'd say before you even block it at that point, just go ahead and draw a line. Like what I'll, I'll often do is um, do a row of knitting, a knit row on the wrong side to just have a dividing line like, like this again. See the way you've just got one row of, um, which gives you pearl bumps along here so that it's obvious that you've got a break. Because of course, that's what I'll be doing as well when I am doing my swatching to start with. Because while I am not matching a gauge, I do need to figure out what gauge is going to work best for the stitch pattern that I'm looking at. 
and for the yarn that I'm looking at. So I'll go through a couple of different needle sizes, particularly if it's an unknown yarn to me, I'll take the recommended one. And if I know I want to get around the same gauge as what they're looking at, like I don't want it particularly loose or especially tight, I'll swatch at that gauge. I'll swatch at a smaller needle size to see if I prefer it. I'll swatch at a looser one, generally speaking, and figure out what one gives me the nicest looking stitches and the kind of fabric that I'm looking for. Because sometimes if like with something like this, because I want lace and I want a bit more open, I don't want a particularly tight fabric. So I actually went up to a four millimeter with this and it's a sports weight yarn. So it's happy also at like several needle sizes smaller, but the effect I'm looking for is a bit more open, a bit more drapey, and it's going to have so it's really important to kind of make sure that whatever needle size you've got is going to match the kind of fabric you're looking for. I'll also use several different needle types. I, I really can never ever get over the difference between using a metal versus a wooden or bamboo needle in how the stitches flow off the needle. If I've got a slightly slippy yarn, um, I actually find that wood is quite helpful, that it gives just a small bit more stick and metal, it just slips too much. But then I'll, on the other end, the inverse of that, I suppose, um, I have the opposite thing will end up happening if I've got a woolly yarn, a sticky yarn, like, uh, like Blasta has got a good bit of stick to it. And with that, I love the feel of working with wooden needles, but if I want something a bit tighter, I'll probably go to metal because it's just going to slip a little bit more over the needle and it's going to give me a slightly tighter gauge. But if I'm doing something that where I want it vaguely more drapey, then by all means go with the wood because it's going to give me a looser gauge. So there's actually loads and loads of different things at play is, and in terms of how you swatch. But the big thing is, don't just confine it to the amount of stitches that you think you're going to need for four inches. Make it bigger. Make it a bit longer as well so that you can, um, you can measure several different spots because that's something else also that your gauge isn't consistent. We're, we're not machines. When we knit, when we're tense, it's going to get tighter. When we're relaxed or if the weather's hot and our fingers are sticky and slippy, it's going to get looser. Your gauge changes all the time. Even within a row, you might find that you're going to have loose stitches, tight stitches. Some yarns are, le are more forgiving and less forgiving. I think things like um, cotton fibers, plant fibers, because there isn't an inherent elasticity in the yarn, you're going to, you're much more likely to have a little bit more unevenness in your stitches. Now that does block out when you block, but it means that when you're measuring the gauge, you have to be very careful. And usually the best way of doing that is take the gauge, you know, the number of stitches you get in four inches over several different spots. And if the swatch is big enough, you can actually do that and get, you, get, you can get an average then. So if you've got one place where it's 25, another where it's 24, another where it's 23, you, you know, you can actually then go and take what looks like a fairly even gauge and go with that. Like I'll often discount if there's places where it looks very obviously tight, I might avoid that. Or again, you know, if you, for some reason, have a very loose stitch. So you can just kind of, you can discount those sections and perhaps look at the ones that look like a more, a more standard gauge and one that you think that you're more likely to get over a bigger piece, a bigger project because our gauge also changes depending on the size of our knitting. That I know for me, when I'm doing something that's seamless and particular, like I'm just thinking, I'm not even bringing knitting into the round at this point, but just knitting flat, but very long rows. And if it's something like garter or stockinette stitch, I'm way more likely to relax. And as I relax, my knitting is more likely to get loose. So it wouldn't be uncommon for me to have a, tighter gauge in the swatch than in the finished pieces I'm working through it. So it is really important as well to measure through as you're, as you're going through it. Um, and the gauge you want is the finished gauge as well after it's blocked. It's really, really important because when you, when you, before you wear your piece, um, like I'm just talking garments now, but it was going to apply to hats and everything as well. But before you wear it, you're going to block it. And if you block it and the gauge changes and you didn't take into account that that was going to happen in your swatch, you're going to end up with a piece that is potentially too big. Because generally 
when things get wet, they're more likely to open out. Or what happens very often actually is the, the row gauge gets wider and or the stitch gauge gets wider and the row gauge gets less, that it spreads and shrinks is, is free. I won't say always, definitely not always, but it's a fairly likely outcome of, um, of swatching. So if you're worried that the yarn you're working with is going to change quite a bit with blocking, there's something you can actually even do. You can, before you block, you can measure your gauge, figure out what the stitch gauge is, what the row gauge is, taking into account that it's not going to be your finished piece. But just to give you an idea of what it's going to, uh, how it's going to change so that you won't be surprised. I've even had somebody say where they kind of, as they pin it out, they'll just even draw around it to get the shape, block it, and then put the other one on top to see how much change they've gotten. And the usefulness of that is if as you're knitting, you feel like it's a little bit too small or a little bit too big in different directions, you can use that as a reality check. You can say, okay, this is the size that my swatch was before I blocked it. And this is the size it was afterwards. And if there was a big change, you know that you can take that into consideration with your knitting and that it's going to be changing when you finish it. So that's, I think that's actually really useful if you're ever worried about um, a fabric growing, particularly the kind of things that's going to really play into is something like superwash, because superwash, the way I view it is when you wash superwashed items and you're putting them out to block, it's it's like trying to handle wet spaghetti. It just, it is all over the place, particularly a seamless garment. Like it will get cohesive again and come back into shape, but you have to be really careful with it when it's wet because it'll just, it'll go all over the place basically. So. Uh, keep, keep that in mind when you're handling it, that be gentle with it, keep it on a flat surface, don't hang it vertically with superwash because you're going to end up with a really long garment. Like, yeah, I think it would actually be kind of impressive how much it would grow if you, if you hung it when it was vertically, when it was drying. So don't do that with superwash, just, just a word of warning. Um, and in terms then of how to block your swatches, it's a question that kind of comes up very often. and. I will always encourage you to block your swatches exactly the way you're going to block your finished knit. So if you know you're going to wash your garment at some point, which most of us do, then I would really encourage you to wash your swatch in the same way. Like what I usually do is I'll use um, soak or eucalyne or some kind of a wool wash, soak it in it, take it out. I've got a front loading washing machine that's got, I can adjust the spin cycle. I put on a really low spin cycle and I will get the moisture out and then I'll pin it out. If it's going to be something like this with lace where it has to be opened up, I'll pin it quite aggressively. If it's just going to even it out, I'll just smooth it out and just pin the edges to stop it rolling and things like that. And then I'll go and I will measure. And I will a little bit further on in, the, um, in this blog here, I'm going to talk about how you measure, particularly if you've got something that's not plain stockinette stitch and stuff. So I'll just go through my methodology for doing that in a minute. But the first thing that you want to do is try your different needle sizes. Don't be afraid to change that. It means that you're going to end up with a project that you really like. If you find the right needle sizes that feel comfortable and the right material, block it the way you're going to finish it and then leave it sit for a little bit because it's like resting. You know, the way with meat, when you take it out of the oven, you shouldn't eat it straight away. You need to leave a rest. Leave your swatches rest for a little bit because if you've had them pinned, they're going to want to spring back a little bit. So you've got to allow that to happen so that when you measure, it's going to be an accurate measurement and not one that has been created by you because you want it to be bigger or you want it to be smaller. Um, as you're working through a project, um, if you're kind of in doubt as to the lengths and things like that, particularly for something that's lace that's going to open up. So I'm making make a mess here. Something like this, a steamer, a hand steamer, or an iron with steam function is your friend. So as I was proceeding through here, this lace really needed to be opened up to get proper length measurements because there was until it was blocked there was no way of doing that i didn't want to take the whole thing off the needles and bind off and, and leave it sit so what i did was i steamed as i worked through and then i could check the lengths accurately so i'll just uh, yeah i just kind of stretched it out steamed it so that it opened the lace up it wasn't perfectly blocked but it was enough that it gave me a fairly good accurate gauge as to lengths 
um, and so I knew where I was going as I was proceeding so that's very very helpful as you go through that steaming for in process blocking is quite useful I know some people um, only do dry cleaning and steaming of garments but I don't think that's the most of us so it's really primarily for kind of in process so let me pop this one down here so that's blocking in general and swatching in general but of course we're getting ready to start on the Lhasa knit along um, I hope some of you are are going to be joining us next week it's next week is going to be the kickoff but before we start we need to block our swatches knit our swatches and then make any changes you need so if you need to change your needle size or your needle type now's the time to figure that out so that when you get to the end game here of actually getting well, starting game of, uh, of actually getting started casting on you're ready to go so once you've got it blocked and you know that your gauge is pretty close to the the gauge and the pattern you can then decide what size you want to go ahead and knit because you can see this is designed to be fairly loose so it's I'll turn her around here it starts with this garter panel and then you pick up stitches along here and you also knit the front and it knits out from this side and then you go back to this side and then the body is picked up and knit from this point down here but you can see how this is where how much wider it is than the body so when we were talking about ease last week and fit this is designed to be loose fitting because these are drop shoulders so there's no shaping it just comes straight out so if you didn't have much ease it'd be sitting up here and they're actually not going to fit very well so it's quite important to get the to have some ease with this or a good bit of ease really so that the sleeves sit out a little bit further and there's comfortable arm movement and you'll also see that with this I don't have any decreases on the sleeve I, because the lace I wanted to simplify it because there was enough going on with the lace so I wanted to have it so that it was just straight down with no decreases and then so that you didn't end up with the very foofy end all the decreases happen here at the start of the garter cuff so that the cuff fits and so it was designed to to really to take a, um, a stitch pattern that might be challenging for people but hopefully kind of simplify it enough that you can still knit a garment with it that has shaping in places that it's easier to put in shaping so that's kind of the overall of how it's fit together and how you figure out your sizing and what I'm going to go show you now is how you can measure the gauge and then how you can calculate the gauge while you're trying to figure out your stitch patterns here and count your rows and all that with the with the lace pattern so come and have a look with me now as promised I want to talk and show a little bit in detail how you can go about measuring your gauge off a swatch now this is obviously the finished piece and what you'll actually discover if you try to go back and measure gauge off finished pieces particularly one like this where it's a little bit more aggressively blocked is that you're going to get a bit of variation particularly in row gauge so like you'll see here where because I was opening up the lace the body is going to be blocked a little bit more vertically that the garter is quite stretched out whereas up here where it was left a little bit flatter because there's a big block of it it's a little bit more squished up but it can stretch and come back down so you're going to get a bit of variation in the row gauge for the garter so when you're going and measuring something like garter stitch um, sometimes people find it easier to well, these aren't great but normally you might have smaller pins where you can actually go and put it in on one end and then go over to this is not completely flat down here so I don't know how accurate keep it on the same row here and pop it in kind of the end here um, and then you can take this away I usually use a pointer of some sort because I find that it's just much easier to actually measure and you see the way it's up and down and up and down I usually pick which I'm going to count because it's going to be like the up part and the down part is one stitch but every so I, I, the way I view it is every time I finish one of these down I suppose the people think of them as as frowns and smiles okay the end of a smile we'll say is going to be one stitch so it'll be one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty and over here where I have this is my 21 stitches here so that's how you kind of measure it with garter stitch because it can get a bit confusing where there's the ups and the downs 
with the rose, what you're looking at is a garter stitch is bumps and furrows. So these are your row of bumps up and then there's a furrow down and each one of those is a row. And I'll often with garter stitch actually just measure one and then count it as twice. So for like we're, going, we're saying we've got 32 rows, which if you divide that in half is going to give you 16 bump furrows. So I'll generally start off with, say I'll begin with this at a furrow and then we'll count that as two, three, four, five, six, um, hang on, I'm losing track of myself, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, so on going up until four. I got a feeling that my row gauge has changed a little bit here because the blocking has adjusted a bit. So I'm just going to ignore that for now. <laughs> but I'm going to move on to what I think is actually probably more critical and can get quite tricky for people is trying to measure gauge when you've got something like lace. Because of course you've got this big opening and you've got these squishy bits, big opening and squishy bits. And you kind of look and it's like, how can I possibly measure stitches in that? And my answer to you is you don't, you measure uh, stitch pattern repeats. So this stitch pattern has got this, this is three, three stitches and one stitch. So from here to here is four stitches. A little bit easier to see here, but it's still going to be, I, I, so what I actually end up doing is I measure um, stitch pattern repeats. So I'll go from, take it, you know, at the start of this and the opening, that's four stitches eight, 12, 16, and so forth. So what I actually can do then is I'll measure something pretty close. Like over here, you can see if I have five repeats of that four stitch pattern repeat, it's going to give me 20 stitches. So I should be getting about 3.75 for five repeats. So let's take a look at that there. So it's one, two, three, four, five and it's bringing me up you can see to 3.75 here so it's actually and then at 3.75 we can measure how close we get with that so you do that by taking cross multiply 20 multiplied by four inches which is what we want to get divide by 3.75 so it's 20 by four divide 3.75 and that's, no, oh, I did something wrong. 20 by four divide 3.75. And that's going to give me 21.33 stitches. So that's pretty close, particularly for lace because it's so, it's it goes in and out so much. And you can do the same thing with the row gauge where the six here you've got, this is from here up to here is three rows and then it jumps over here and that's another three rows. So you can do it in either six or probably three pattern repeats where you can measure this is a set number of pattern repeats, write down how many inches you get from that and then you can calculate how many rows you have in four inches and get a feel for how close you are to the stitch pattern. But with something like this, measuring your pattern, um, measuring your pattern repeats is far and away the easiest way of doing that. And then just going and using the calculation there where you take the number of stitches you're using, multiply it by four and divide it by how many inches it takes. And that'll give you how many stitches you have for what you've knit in four inches. So hopefully that is helpful and gives you insight into how to, um, to measure the gauge for lace patterns. So now that we've gone through how to measure both the garter and the lace swatches, I hope that you've got the tools to be able to use either for the Lhasa knit along or alternatively to jump in for other patterns that you've been a little bit apprehensive and not really sure how to tackle because there were stitch patterns and things like that in them. If this is new to you and you want the support, then come join us for the knit along because we've got videos showing every stage of the project as you go through. And while the knit along is in progress, the videos are actually all come as part of the knit along. But if you wait until afterwards, it's actually then a whole separate workshop project still available, but it's just no longer part of the pattern. So 
it's a bonus of joining us for the knit along is that you get all of the workshop videos so i hope you enjoyed our second episode of our vlog uh, come back next week and join us for episode number three Thank you.